Hello everyone, my name is Marcus collier Wright, co-founder and CTO of Neutron Star Systems. I'm very happy to be here today at the Mars Society Convention. Uh, I'm very uh, sad that I can't be with you in person nor with you live, uh, unfortunately due to term uh, appointment conflicts. Uh, however, I am looking forward to give this pre-recorded presentation on progress and research and development of superconductor-based applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thruster technology. A special thanks also to my colleagues Manuel and Elias who helped me to prepare this work. So uh, just as an overview, I'll be going over applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, providing an introduction to what they are, how they work and then talking about high temperature superconductors as the uh, additional component or technology which is needed to make them really um, desirable and compelling for space travel. I'll talk a little bit about some of the global developments as well as our efforts at NSS on developing this technology and uh, also look at some high power mission use cases specifically for Mars uh, in fitting with the theme of the convention and then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. So the applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thruster is a type of electric propulsion system which means we're using electrical power to generate thrust. In a uh, magnetoplasma dynamic thruster or MPD thruster as I will call it from now on, uh, we have two main electrodes which are arranged concentrically and with a electrical insulator between them. What we do is we apply a potential difference across the two electrodes and thereby we create an electric field. And we then feed in a propellant mass flow uh, between the anode and the cathode, which in the presence of the electric field gets ionized and forms a plasma. Now this plasma is then able to conduct an electrical arc between the anode and the cathode, which in turn generates a self-induced magnetic field uh, by means of the Lorentz force and then the interaction of the self-induced magnetic field with the electric field previously created results in an acceleration force which pushes the particles out of the thruster. This is at its core the magnetoplasma dynamic thruster concept, um, however this version is termed a self-field MPD thruster because it only operates with using the self-induced field. The issue with this type of thruster is that you need very high amounts of current and hence very high amounts of power in order for it to be effective. This limits some of the applications, because you can only put it on high power spacecraft, and it also limits the lifetime of the thruster because the high currents provide or result in erosion on the electrodes. So to overcome this issue, what we do is we bring a secondary magnetic field called the applied field, which we apply in an actual direction of the thruster. Uh, this is often done with a uh, electromagnet or a solenoid, but can also be done with a permanent magnet. And by applying this additional magnetic field, we result in two further acceleration mechanisms, also coming from the interaction of the applied field and the induced current. These are the Hall acceleration and the Swirl acceleration. So all of these acceleration mechanisms work together to force the uh, propellant out of the thruster in the form of plasma. And uh, in doing so, with this approach, we have a number of benefits over some of the existing technologies. So we have a wide open area where the plasma can be accelerated and where it can expand. And this allows us to have a significant amount of scalability in terms of how much power we can uh, process in this area. We can process much more amounts of power in a small, compact and lightweight form than other thrusters. It also allows us to have a significant level of throttleability because we have a number of different parameters here that we can vary. Uh, this also gives us a level of propellant flexibility because we are able to operate on propellants which uh, are not so rare and expensive like xenon. Instead, we can use argon. Uh, and this is thanks to the fact that we're not accelerating the individual ions, but actually we're accelerating the entire plasma mass as a whole. Uh, and this in turn leads to the fourth benefit, which is that we don't need an external neutralizer for this thruster, which simplifies the design of the thruster, the design of the electronic power supply, and uh, in general also makes it uh, much more reliable because we don't need additional components for the operation to succeed. Now, this is not a new concept. The AFMPD thruster has been around for over 60 years. 
The first research was performed in both the United States and in Germany in the 1960s. And uh, actually the first MPD using superconductors was tested by NASA in 1972 using low temperature superconductors. Uh, this was a little bit of a, let's say, garage setup with some uh, very much breadboard apparatus. However, it did show the concept of using superconductors for MPD. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, we also had uh, Russia and uh, Japan getting involved on FMPD development. Um, they actually led most of the activities in this time with uh, a number of flight missions being performed as experiments. Uh, and then until the 2010s, there was not too much research going on. However, since the last 12 years, there's been a renaissance in interest in MPD with um, uh, IRS Stuttgart leading the way in the 2010s in Germany, whereas also China and uh, Russia are moving forward on this development because they have produced the first two thrusters using high temperature superconducting coils in 2020 and 2021 and uh, New Zealand are now also developing a program. I want to talk now about the SX3 thruster, which is the prototype thruster that we have at Neutron Star Systems together with our partner, the University of Stuttgart. This is a 100 kilowatt class prototype. So that's quite a lot of power and it weighs only 13 kilos. So this indicates just how power dense these devices can be and how scalable they are. The issue is that at the moment, it is operating with a conventional copper coil. And uh, this copper coil is this very large gray object you see in the picture. This weighs 150 kilos. It consumes only 300 kilowatts of power just to operate the coil. And this is really the issue which prevents the thruster from being used on the spacecraft. Despite this, we have been able to generate some very promising results together with Stuttgart. Uh, what we've been able to achieve is uh, long-term steady state operation. We've been able to demonstrate thrust efficiencies up to 62%, which is competitive with other existing technologies, and thrust levels up to 3.6 Newtons, which is extremely high for an electric propulsion system. Um, however, what I want to really highlight here is the importance of the magnetic field strength. So I've taken here two data points from our experimental campaigns, 100 and 400 millitesla. And when we go to higher magnetic fields, you see in general, we are able to reach much higher levels of thrust efficiency. This also allows us to operate at high voltage and low current, which is very beneficial for two reasons. Firstly, this reduces the erosion of the electrodes. Secondly, it allows us to operate in similar mode as full thrusters, which allows us to make use of existing flight qualified designs for hollow cathodes and power processing units. Uh, and what does this mean at the end of the day? It means that we can achieve higher levels of thrust and higher levels of specific impulse, which is at the end of the day what is most important for a propulsion system on the spacecraft. So basically, we have the situation now where we want to go to higher magnetic fields. And this isn't based just off the data from the SX3, but this has been correlated with data also from the University of Nagoya, where you can see a clear correlation in what we call the JVR model, which states that the magnitude of the thrust and acceleration is driven by the uh, discharge current, J, the applied magnetic field strength, B, and the uh, anode radius R. Now, of course, we want to keep the anode radius small to prevent the thruster from becoming too large. We want to keep the discharge current small to prevent electrode erosion, which means that we want to increase B magnetic field strength in order to increase performance. And of course, we need to be able to overcome the mass and volume limitations that we're faced with when we have the copper electromagnet. That is where high temperature superconductors come in. So superconductors are materials that can conduct uh, large amounts of electricity with zero resistance when they're cooled down below a certain temperature known as their critical temperature. Uh, what this means is that you can essentially conduct huge amounts of electricity in very small and compact cables or tapes. And what's important to note here is that we talk about high temperature superconductors. What does this mean? Well, to understand this, we need to look at the history of superconductivity which started over 100 years ago in the 1900s with the discovery of the first superconductors, which had to be cooled down to nearly 4 Kelvin in order to demonstrate superconductivity. Going to such low temperatures is really challenging from cryogenic systems perspective, especially in space. However, in the 1980s, a new class of materials was discovered, 
which exhibit superconductivity at much higher temperatures, even above the point of liquid nitrogen boiling. Uh, these are various rare earth metal copper oxides, which can be superconducting temperatures even as high as uh, over 100 Kelvin. This technology has now been matured since the last 40 years, um, thanks to various terrestrial applications like uh, power lines, transformers, MRI machines. And now we can get these tapes from commercial suppliers at economies of scale in the form that you see there on the right. This is a multi-layer tape with a pastelloy substrate acting as a mechanical stabilizing layer, a number of different buffer layers which serve to uh, protect from humidity issues and also serve as a baseline for the actual superconductor itself, which is only a few microns thick. And then the entire tape is uh, coated in a uh, silver layer, most commonly, um, to allow for uh, electrical conductivity and uh, soldering and then we also have uh, in some cases a copper layer which provides further opportunities for soldering and also further mechanical stabilization so now that these superconductors are available on the market at very uh, reasonable prices and uh, economies of scale we can start to think about using them in space also thanks to the fact that we can operate them at much higher temperatures which means our cryogenic demands are significantly reduced and such an application is, of course, for AFMPD thrusters, where the use of superconductors can enable the use of uh, very high magnetic fields to increase efficiency whilst maintaining the magnet mass and volume and, crucially, operating power at much lower values than is possible with the uh, conventional copper electromagnet. This was first demonstrated by the Russians in 2020 when they reported details of their 25 kilowatt class MPD thruster using superconducting coils. Uh, they reported that they were able to achieve up to 3%, uh, three times increase in the thrust efficiency when they went up to one Tesla magnetic field strength. Uh, they reported up to 54% thrust efficiency, which is lower than the SX3. However, it is worth to mention that this is very much an unoptimized design and very much an experimental setup, whereas uh, the SX3 is an optimized design what this does show, however, is the potential to get to very high efficiencies with superconductors. Followed closely in the footsteps of the Russians was uh, a new prototype which was published last year by uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, this time for a 150 kilowatt class magnet, which you can see there in the vacuum chamber. And you see on the right a example of the design of this uh, superconducting AFMPD prototype. There you see the superconducting coil uh, on the outside and the central assembly containing the electrodes. What's worth to point out here is that this uh, prototype is still using water cooling, so it's not addressing the thermal challenges of insulating a superconducting coil from a plasma plume. Nonetheless, it does uh, allow the demonstration of the superconducting magnetic field strength or MPD performance. And here's some more details on that. So, as I mentioned, 150 kilowatt class prototype, so a high power prototype, and they were able to achieve 77% thrust efficiency, which is uh, extremely high. Uh, it's higher than what's been achieved on any ball thruster, and only grid and thrusters come close to achieving such high efficiencies. Uh, also, a very high ISP of nearly 6,000 seconds with argon. So again, very impressive results. And this was only with 0.56 Tesla magnetic field strength. So this gives an indication of what's possible with a more optimized design. Uh, potentially, most importantly, is what they were able to demonstrate with the uh, cathode erosion, which you see there on the left side of the screen. These are images of two identical cathodes, which were run in the thruster for the same amount of time. The one on the left with a, a relatively low magnetic field strength like with a normal magnet and the one on the right with the superconducting magnet at its full strength. And uh, they were both from 50 hours. And on the left you can see the cathode is completely destroyed and eroded and on the right it looks almost brand new. So this also helps to demonstrate the hypothesis that high magnetic field strengths and uh, lower operating currents help to reduce the cathode erosion. Next we have the 
activities from New Zealand led by Rogers from Research Institute who have a strong expertise on superconductor applications and significant heritage in this area. Uh, in particular they have a very interesting technology known as the flux pump which you see there on the left and this is a way to load up the superconducting coil without a physical contact instead by using uh, induction principles through the use of a rotating magnet which then induces the current in the coil. This is important because the physical connection between a uh, power source and a superconducting coil is responsible for between 70 and 80 percent of the cryogenic heat loads that you have for cooling the coil uh, because you need to transition the cables from room temperature down to cryogenic temperature. So the issue that you have is that uh, this causes heating which needs to be removed and significantly reduces the system efficiency. If you're able to remove the physical connection, you can significantly save on your cryogenic power budget, which makes your overall system power efficiency much better. So this is something they're looking to implement, and the latest status that I have is that they're aiming for a flight demo of a full thrust by 2025, whereas they already have plans to put a coil in space on the International Space Station as soon as next year. Um, and then the fourth uh, institute or uh, body working on uh, MPD is us at Neutron Star Systems. Um, and actually this is something we started really looking at uh, nearly five years ago now. Um, and we did this in the framework of our concept called Supreme, uh, which is the replacement of the applied field magnet with a superconducting magnet. What we're expecting with the use of the superconductor is a reduction in mass of the order of four times on the magnet, a reduction in power consumption on the order of 300 times, and the ability to generate magnetic field strengths which are four times stronger, which in turn will improve performance and thrust lifetime. So this for us is a significant improvement which can take the MPD from something which is stuck in the lab at the moment to a flight feasible technology. With our Supreme concept, we are planning to address a whole wide range of market scenarios, starting from near-term applications like uh, geocommunication satellites and transfer vehicles, looking at a five kilowatt uh, market entry class, but also then looking at future applications like on-orbit servicing, uh, refueling and maintenance, and also then beyond Earth activities like carbon transfers to the Mars, uh, to the Moon, and to Mars. The benefit of Supreme can be quite clearly seen in this chart where we have on the y-axis the thrust per power, so how much thrust we can generate for each kilowatt of power that we have available to us. And on the x-axis we have specific impulse. What you see here is there's always a trade-off between the two. Uh, for higher thrust you typically reach a lower specific impulse and this is limited by the thrust efficiency. Thrust efficiencies are given by the uh, curved dotted lines going from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. And what's interesting to note here is the relatively narrow concentration of operating points that we have for wall effect thrusters on the left and figure down thrusters in the dark blue. What this means is that these thrusters are only suited to certain operating modes, which limits the mission applications. Whereas with Supreme, also, thanks to our propellant flexibility, we expect to be able to access the entire blue shaded area, meaning we can be used for uh, high demand missions like uh, orbit raising, but also for missions which require more efficient operation like deep space missions or for station keeping applications, for example. Uh, to go into a bit more detail why this is important, we need to look at the non-dimensional rocket equation. Those of you who know anything about propulsion will be familiar with the standard rocket equation, which relates the change in velocity of your spacecraft to the specific impulse of the propulsion system and the final and initial masses. So based on this, if we want to minimize the amount of fuel that we are using and maximize our payload mass fraction, i.e. how much of our initial mass is useful payload, we should always go for the highest uh, specific impulse because this will then give us the highest amount of delta V for a given fuel mass. And that is true if we're looking at chemical thrusters, which of course have high thrust, have low ISP, but critically, the energy for these systems is coming from the propellant itself, from the chemicals inside the propellant and the chemical bonds. 
However, for electric systems, the energy doesn't come from the propellant. The energy is coming from the electrical power system. The propellant simply gets accelerated. Um, this is why we're able to reach, reach much higher ISPs, but also lower thrusts. Uh, but this is a very critical aspect to keep in mind when we look at the rocket equation. Uh, to understand why, we need to go back to the previous chart where we have our thrust and a specific impulse relationship. And what we need to think about is what about a real world scenario where we need to do a mission in a certain time. We need to get from point A to point B within a certain time frame in order for it to be commercially viable. Think about that. If you have a time or transfer time requirement in an orbital maneuver, this in turn makes it a, a thrust requirement. You need a sufficiently high thrust to be able to perform that maneuver in the given time. So let's say now that we want to increase our ISP and go to a higher efficiency system, so we use less fuel. Well, that's great, but the sacrifice you make is that you have to uh, reduce the amount of thrust because this is the fundamental relationship between thrust and ISP. Going to higher ISPs means that you have to have a relatively lower thrust. But what's important on the left or on the y-axis is that we're not talking just about thrust, but thrust per power. Which means that actually we can maintain the thrust that we generate with our electric system at a higher ISP if we have enough power to compensate for it. So if I double the power available, I can double the thrust I get whilst maintaining the ISP, or I can move to a higher ISP in order to maintain the thrust. What this means is that if we're looking again at our transfer time and our thrust requirement, then to go to high ISP and still fulfill this requirement, we need larger amounts of power. But what does this mean? It means that our power system also becomes heavier because we need larger cables to manage the larger power. We need larger solar arrays to generate that power. We need all the power electronics to be adapted accordingly. And if this increase in power system mass becomes too high, then this in turn reduces the payload mass fraction actually because suddenly you're adding mass to your spacecraft, which isn't payload, it's just power system. Um, so as you can see, there's a balance here that needs to be, thin, uh, needs to be found. Excuse me. And uh, what we need to really consider as well is how does the mass of the power system affect the rocket equation? Now you can't do this with the standard rocket equation, so we have the non-dimensional rocket equation, which relates the payload mass fraction to a number of terms, including the given maneuver, how much delta v we need to make, uh, the exhaust velocity of the system, which is correlated to the specific impulse, the thrust efficiency, and also the transfer time requirement. And there in the middle, the mass specific power of the power supply system, the C parameter, this is the critical part because we want to make this as low as possible because that means that we have a very, uh, very mass efficient power system. To try and put this into an example, which makes it easy to understand, on this graph on the right, we have taken the example, well, not we, uh, someone from literature has taken the example of the uh, geocommunication satellite which needs to be uh, orbit raised from wherever the rocket leaves it to its final uh, operating point in the uh, geosynchronous orbit belt. And um, taking into account the delta V there and some typical propulsion system characteristics and uh, C parameter characteristics, you end up with these charts when you plot the performance of the mission across different specific impulses. On the left, we have the payload mass fraction so obviously we want to make this as high as possible. And what you can see is that when we relax the transfer time requirement from two months to four to six to eight months, we're able to achieve higher payload mass fractions. That's because we uh, don't need so much power to fulfill our thrust and enhance our time requirement, which means that we have less mass and we can have a more fuel efficient system. However, what's also notable is that there's optimum specific impulse beyond which increasing the high specific impulse actually reduces your payload mass fraction. Whilst that might seem a little bit counter-logical at first, what you have to remember is that going to higher ISP means that we go to lower thrust, means that we need higher amount of power to counteract that thrust and fulfill our transfer time requirement, which actually in turn makes the payload mass fraction even worse. 
And um, for commercial missions going to GEO, we look at around six months orbit raising requirement. And as you can see there, the optimum ISP is around 1600 seconds, which really explains why Hall effect thrusters are so popular for this application on all electric satellites. Let's apply this to a high power mission where actually the impact is even stronger. And uh, what we've done is not just looked at the propulsion system, but the entire spacecraft system using superconductors throughout various different parts of the system. And um, what you see with the dotted line is the payload mass fraction curves for conventional technologies. And with the solid line, you see these same curves, but for superconducting technologies or superconductor based systems, superconducting MPD, superconducting power transmission and so on. And you can see you really get a significant increase in the total payload mass fraction, for example, for a cargo mission to Mars, where you can save up to 7% of your payload mass fraction by using a superconducting system. And uh, we've just had an article about this published in Acta Astronautica, so I really encourage you to check it out if you're interested. Okay, just to close up, I uh, wanted to mention a few of the other projects we're working on in neutron star systems for uh, superconductors in aerospace. So we have this project called MIST, which is a European Union project. And um, here we are looking at the application of superconductors and magnetic fields to shielding spacecrafts during the re-entry phase of a mission by generating an electromagnetic field around the spacecraft, which can shield it from the oncoming hot plasma that is experienced at the atmosphere. We'll be running some tests later this year and early next year in a plasma wind tunnel to see how this works. Um, and actually, we hope that we can also use the same principle for radiation shielding applications. Um, we're also currently in the middle of a contract to the European Space Agency to develop a harness for cryogenic applications where using superconductors for uh, conducting electricity to scientific instrumentation. Uh, whilst this is quite a niche application, the same principle should in theory be possible for high power spacecraft and power transmission, where the superconductors can enable large amounts of power to be transmitted in very compact and lightweight cables and most importantly without any losses. In parallel, we are slowly working on the design of a CubeSat mission to test the superconducting coil in space. The idea is to make a quick and cheap and dirty mission where we can send a coil into space on a CubeSat and uh, switch it on, show that we can operate the superconducting coil in space, show that it can survive the launch environment and the in-space environment, and that we can generate a large magnetic field. Um, and one of the ideas we have is to actually perform a deorbit of this CubeSat and uh, do a basic experiment for re-entry shielding. So this is also something we have a pipeline. And finally, we have our low power AFMPD, which we are currently uh, developing in the framework of an Air Force Research Lab, uh, STTR contract. The idea here is to use permanent magnets instead of superconductors to downscale the thruster down to one kilowatt level, and deploy it on small satellites, but also to make use of the propellant flexibility that we have to allow the thruster to operate together with a chemical system, meaning that you can have both high thrust and high specific impulse operations, which is especially important for maneuverability, space debris avoidance, on orbit servicing and several other relevant applications. So to wrap up, uh, I want to just leave you with some main conclusions. Firstly, AFMPD has been widely researched for over 60 years, but has been held back by the limits of conventional electromagnetic technology. What we are suggesting and promoting is the use of superconductors, not just for AFMPD, but for actually many space applications, because of their compelling proposition to be able to generate large, uh, large magnetic fields, to be able to process large amounts of electricity, in very compact and lightweight forms and this makes them really well suited for spacecraft applications in particular for AFMPD where the use of superconductors can overcome massive volume limitations but also enable much higher uh, performances and increase lifetime. We're not the only ones who have looked at this with uh, competitors in China, Russia and New Zealand now also working on the same technologies um, however, we are focusing on the most critical challenges that we see, uh, which is thermal management, um, optimization of magnetic field, 
digital twin activities and also downscaling to lower powers. So I really appreciate that you took the time to listen. I uh, hope you found the presentation interesting and in case you have any questions, please do get in touch.